last Sunday, uh, I, I, I did a message on the fact that we're influencers and the fact that we have circles of influence that we deal with all the time. A lot of people really don't think they're influencers. They don't think they're leaders. They think people really don't, you know, some of us are more introverted than others, and, and, and some of us think it's the leaders, it's the people that are out front that they're influencers, but, but we're all influencers. And, and last week I just gave a list, and, and, I, and it's not in your notes, but, but last week I talked about our circle influence being, first of all, ourself, are we putting ourselves in the position where we're being influenced positively with the books we read and prayer and the friends we have and things like that? The, the influence that we have on our spouse, the influence we have on our kids, the influence we have on the people that we work with, the social influences, including the Internet. And one of the things we talked about last week was uh, right before a lot of y'all got here, when all of our first touch team was out there, I said, all right, go to your Facebook page right now and check in and put just two rules, love God and love people. Then I went up there and looked and pow, 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 all these were in the timeline. Those are all touches where people are saying, you know, I'm coming to my church and, and, and it's a way to influence people. So, so not just your social, is it the people you're around? Because life has changed so much with the internet. You have an influence. And then the influence you have on your church family is so important. And the influence that your church family has on you is so important. And then here's the, the short paragraph that I gave you last week. Everyone is a person of influence who influences people, who influence many, who influence generations. Now, if you think about what that does, if, if you just... Let's just say you live in a bubble and you just have one person that you're ever influenced on, influence, and that person influence others and influence others. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, the opportunities we have to influence people. And what we talked about last week is this you're an influencer whether you want to or not. Because Jesus said, You will be my witness. So if you're a Christian who's not living your life as a Christian, you're being. But there's a positive way to be an influence. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How to choose to be an influence. We, we don't always think about whether we're an influence or not. But how do we choose to be an influence? And how do we choose to be a, a, a positive influence? Because I just want to tell you something. If you're, if, you're, if you're thinking, if someone was to ask you, you know, you're a Christian. What exactly does that mean as far as your behavior? You know, here's the answer. Your job is to represent God through Jesus Christ. That's your job. Whether you do it in a retail store or as a stay-at-home mom or whatever, whatever situation you're in, your job. And we've got some cool stories in here of, of people who have, who have seen people's lives change around them. And we hope we're going to have them on video for you here in the, in the, in the next couple of weeks. But, but we're influencers. And, and, and the way we go about living our life, you've you got to ask yourself these questions. Am I living out my faith? Not just do I believe in God and do I go to church. Am I living out my faith? Can people look at me and see that I'm different? Can people look at me and see that I'm different? Are you committed to serving God and loving people? Are you committed to serving God and loving people? If someone you work with or your kid or your neighbor looks at your life, do they see that you're a person who lives by just two rules? Loving God and loving people oh you know who those people are they stand out and they stand out in a good way not a mean way they stand out in a loving way their their commitment and their, their commitment impresses people the the disciples right after Jesus came back right before he went off forever 
He's, he's been crucified and now he's resurrected and he's came back. The Bible said he came back and hung out for 40 days. So for 40 days he met with, it was, it was like he was doing little meetings with everybody. He came back to, you know, and he, he went to y'all small group and to show you that he was here. And he went to y'all small group and show you that he's here. And he went to y'all small group and ate pizza. And, you know, he, he did all of that stuff and he came. And the Bible says he did that for 40 days. And he, and he talked about what he did. He talked about the resurrection. He talked about the fact that the kingdom of God has come to earth and 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 the disciples started asking them they wanted to know well when's it going to happen when's it going to happen when do we have to get out of this crud that we live in and get to live in the kingdom of God all the time and some of y'all know what Jesus said Jesus said you know it's not for you to know he said only the father knows So that means we have a job to do until that happens. We have a job to do in that happen, when that happens. And in Acts 1, verses 7 and 8, I've got there on your notes, it says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know, but you don't just sit around in your churches You don't just sit around having your meals. You don't just sit around doing communion. You don't just sit around doing worship. You don't just sit around doing inside church. He said, you've got to take the church outside. You will receive the power to do that when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Now, what most Christians struggle with when they see that, they go, oh, I know what happened just a minute ago when Meg was making the announcement and she said, we're going to go out and invite the neighbors. Some of y'all went, you're not people, people. And the thought of knocking on somebody's door and, 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 and inviting them. And, and by the way, that's not how we do it. What we're going to do is we're going to go to people's doors and we're going to take a little invitation that we've made up just like we did with the block party. And we'll, we'll, we'll knock on the door. They come to the door, we'll hand it to them. If we don't, we'll tape a little piece of it right there on the we won't pull any paint off or anything, right on the handle of their door. And, and, and that's to invite people to come. But see, most people, most people are fearful about telling people about their faith. I mean, think about it. How often do most people do it? There's probably people that you work with that you don't even know what they believe. You've seen a little fish on the back of their car, but they've never even mentioned anything about God or their, their church or anything. Let me tell you something. You're not going to have the confidence to share your witness if your witness isn't worth a crud. That's a paraphrase of... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're, you're not going to have the confidence to a witness if, if your witness isn't that good. If, you know, there are things you do in your life that you just think, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody I did that, you know, because it's, it's a bad thing. But, but we love telling people the good things. You know, this happened or, or that happened. And now that Facebook's around, I mean, everybody's telling everybody about everything that's going on in their life. And I'll be honest with you. Some things we don't really want to know about, but 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 that's what we do, and and because we we feel good about doing that, and but you're never really going to feel good about sharing your witness to the gospel until the commitment's there in all areas of your life, till the commitment's there in all areas of your life, and and even if you did. Because there are people out there that go to church that don't act very Christian. And they don't really impress people at all, do they? So we have to live our lives in a way that's impressive. Not because we want to please people, but because we want to honor God. We impress people with the choices that we make and the decisions we make to live out our lives. And the next thing I've put there on your notes is this. If you love God first then through the Holy Spirit, you will have confidence to love others and influence them toward God. If you will love God first, you will have the confidence to, you will have the confidence to love others and influence people toward God. Galatians 1.10 says, the Apostle Paul wrote, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. Now, some people look at that 
as in I need to be judgmental, I need to be mean. Why? Because I'm trying to please God. No, 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 no. We know very clearly the Bible says if you're not doing it with love, you are not pleasing God. You are not pleasing God if you're not doing it with love. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant, the Apostle Paul says. So here's, here's, here's something for you. Beware or caution. Your default nature is to please people. Would you agree? Huh? I mean, we make decisions. We make decisions to do things because it's our default nature to please people. We make business decisions. We go to places that we know we're not supposed to. We Look, I... I talked to a guy this week that, uh, that him and his business partner, when they went into business together, they made this commitment. We will not go to lunch at any place like Hooters or places that you go to look instead of eat. That's a decision they made. Now, you would talk to some business people and they go, well, no, we got to take people out and we got to get them drunk and we got to take them out to strip clubs and we've got to. No, but this is a decision that they've made. And, and, and what happened is, is several times when they've worked with somebody, that person has gone, hey, let's go to lunch. Let's go to Hooters. And they'll go, ah, you know, we just, we're, we're married. <laughs> and they're thinking, you know, I'm Christian and I'm married. I just don't go to those places places but they just said no we just we don't go to those places do you mind if we go somewhere else and and the guy goes yeah and then the guy called him again for another meeting and he said hey let's go to and he mentioned another one of those places bone daddies or twin peaks or there's a reason they're called that you know they're called that not because they got good wings that's not why they're called that they're called that because they got good things to look at that you're not supposed to look at so uh no no and he said okay oh no no that's okay and then a later conversation the guy was talking and just carried on and he dropped the f-bomb you know what he did he immediately apologized they didn't say oh my goodness you said the f-bomb they didn't no the guy dropped the f-bomb and then they thought about the merit he thought about the moral character of the person that he was talking to on the phone and he apologized see we're so worried about pleasing people. Let me tell you something. As a pastor, I have never been asked to go to Hooters. <laughs> not once. All the Christians that think that going to Hooters is a good idea, not once have I ever been invited there for lunch. You know, and I'm not, it, it doesn't bother me that I'm not invited there for lunch. I'll go to IHOP with you any day. But, but, but it bothers me that there are Christians. That, look, there, there are Christians who do things that they wouldn't dare do around their pastor. That's kind of a, that kind of, you know, you can kind of look at your life and go, if Royal is with me, would I do this? If Royal is with me, would I have this argument? And then take it up a bigger, higher level. If Jesus was with me, Jesus wouldn't go to Hooters. You know what I'm saying? I, one time I went to Hooters. I was in my early 20s. I worked for Texas Power and Light. Those kind of places were new. Were you married? I was married. And a, a guy, we, we always went to lunch for people's birthdays. And a guy was asked, where do you want to go to lunch? And he said, Hooters. Well, most of us didn't have a clue what Hooters was all about. And, and I just remember this. And I'm telling you, I wasn't much of a Christian back then. One of the things you've got to realize is most people will respect you. If you respect them and you have a morality about you, they'll respect that. You know why? We're all born with a core of morality. We know things that are right and we know things that are wrong. So here I am, not very good Christian, young. We go to Hooters. And I'm sitting next to a lady that was about 50. And about this time, the lady who was wearing short shorts bent over right in front of my table. <laughs> I'm sitting next to this lady. I went, whoo, look, if it makes you feel uncomfortable like that, then and, and you can apply that to anything that you do. And I've told you this a lot of times. The closer you get to God, the more uncomfortable you get with those kind of things. And I want to, But here's the key. If you want to get to where you impress people, the key is are you consistent? Because the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get tested. When I committed my life to Christ and worked at Test with Power and Light and stopped going to happy hour and uh, bachelor parties that were in places that I shouldn't go to, man, they made fun of me. But I stuck to it. And I told them why. And I respected their, they go do what you want, but I'm just not going to. 
Look, I'm married. I'm not going to go look at those women or do those things. And what happened was they started changing in the office. See, we worry so much about pleasing people. And what we weren't really worried about is we don't want to make them feel bad about their sin, so let's go sin with them. And they think that we think that's a missionary thing, but it's not. You can change people's lives with your consistently and with your own morality. And, and when you show them respect, because they don't understand things the way you do. We were made in God's image. And we're supposed to be representing him. And, and we're supposed to be representing him everywhere we go in, besides just church. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said this. No one can serve two masters, so you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, this is usually used in a giving sermon because Jesus throws that in in the middle of, of money and, 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 and God and whatnot. But, but it's, it's what's most important to you. Are people more important or are God more important? I want to give you five. Is it five? I want to give you six things that you learn from Galatians 1 verses 10 through 24. I want to give you six things about how to live that life that will impress people. And I can promise you, if you will stay committed, you will have some hard times because it first happens. Look, if, if, if you and your wife or you and your husband have not been living a very moral life and you decide to live a moral life, you know what's probably going to happen? Your spouse is going to give you a hard time and they're going to test you. And the people you work with are going to give you a hard time. And they're going to test you. That's where the persecution comes in. You know what Jesus says? Look, if the only reason they're persecuting you is because you're doing what I want you to do, then good. I'm going to bless you for that. And I, I just, I, I just, you know, and some of you are very committed believers and you've seen the impact that that's had on other people in your life. But, but I, I just wish you could understand that 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 what people want more than anything, there's a reason Mormon faith is growing like crazy and the Muslim faith is growing like crazy because people are so people are so upset that nobody's ever committed of, about anything anymore that they're impressed with people that are committed. And to see someone who's committed and lives a life of joy and love and peace, that really affects people's life. Number one, first of all, you have to be confident that the Bible is your source of truth. You have to be, that's going to be the number one thing they're going to go after is, is what your source of truth is and what you believe. You've got to be confident. You've just got to have faith that that's your source of truth. And, 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 and look, at, uh, look at verse 11. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on what? Mere human reasoning. Remember, there are things that seem right to man that lead to death. I hear people all the time that, that, that take things that Jesus say, says or said and, and kind of rewrite it and change it. And people are just like, Christians are going, oh, they're sharing these people's quotes on Facebook. Well, that kind of sounds like what Jesus said, but you really got to go back and look at the source. That sounds really logical and cool and everything, but that's not really the way it is. You've got to be confident that the Bible is your source of truth. You know what that means? You've got to read it. You've got to study it. You've got to understand it. And the Holy Spirit helps you do that. We help you do that. That needs to be, that needs to be the, the, um, the, the, man, the, the paper that you live your life by, your source. I receive my message, Paul says, from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by, say it with me, direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Where does your confidence come from? Now, I will tell you this. If you study the Bible like crazy and you don't live it, you will be an angry, nervous person. Let me say that again. If you study the Bible like crazy, you will be a nervous, angry person if you don't live it. Because you know. 
the conscience is there. The Holy Spirit has taught you. It's there. And, and, and you want to you wanna build your confidence up? You start taking it one step at a time. You take the things that you know already are right and you start living them. And then as you do that, your faith starts growing and you take other levels and you take other levels. I told you all, for me, the greatest change after I committed my life to Christ and after I started living for Him and I was serving all the time and telling people about Jesus and back then I was wearing the Christian t-shirts and all of that other kind of really cool stuff and uh, but my not life there was there was a, a part of my life that I hadn't given to God can you guess what it is if you've been around me a while you know my money because here's what I thought if I just give him enough time if I just give him enough energy, if I just tell people enough about him, I can keep my money. Boy, was I wrong. Because when Lisa and I started giving, tithing, giving sacrificially, was when I was starting a new profession and did not have a penny coming in. Not a penny coming in. And God has taken care of us from then, from then on. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing when you don't hang on tight to something that it doesn't make you so nervous when it's not working the way you think it's supposed to. You know why? Because you're not hanging on so tight to it. You know that God's in control. And if, as you give every single part of your life to God in control, what happens is, is you will start building a confidence in your faith and a confidence in the Word of God. Number two is this. God calls you and He prepares you. God calls you and He prepares you. I've told you all this before. You know, there, there, was a, there was a time in my life where I was afraid that if I really committed my life to God, He was going to call me to do something I hated to do. Like go clean toilets for homeless people or something. I don't know. Something like that. You know, go, go serve the pygmy, pygmies in the darkest of Africa. Something like that. I, you know, just, just the things that, I kind of like it here. I like air conditioning. and I, You know, and it, but, but, but here's the thing. And I found out because I, I would also thought if you'd asked me if I'd be standing up in front of people teaching on the Bible, I'd have thought you were crazy. He calls you and he prepares you. And then you can't wait. People say, man, it must have, it must have been a, it, it must have been a really, it must have taken a ton of faith, Royal, to start Life Connection Church. You know, it didn't take a lot of faith to start Life Connection Church. It took a lot of the faith before I started Life Connection Church. When it came to start Life Connection Church, I'd have gone crazy if I hadn't started Life Connection Church. You know what I'm saying? Because God calls you. And he prepares you. And, and again, you've got to start where you're at and you've got to do it where, you're out, where you are and where you're at. Verse 13, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish, excuse me, the Jewish religion, Paul says, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by His marvelous grace. Then it pleased Him to reveal His Son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. See, even, even when Paul started his ministry, you'd think, how bad a deal is it that he's going to go around and tell people about Jesus? The Gentiles were scared to death of him because, he'd been killing, because he'd, they'd been killing Christians. And second of all, the Jews hated his guts because he wanted to go, because they thought the Jewish people were the only ones that, that should have got Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So, so it, was a, it was a tough thing, but God calls you and he prepares you. Number three, spending personal time with God and being obedient strengthens your faith and your influence. Spending personal time with God and being obedient strengthens your faith and influence. There again, it's very important. The, Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples if you obey my commandments. That's how they know. You don't have to wear a Christian shirt. You don't have to have a fish on the back of your car. They'll know. They'll just know. 
If you're, if you're doing faith with love, the people at your office are going to know, the people that, you have, you, that are your customers are going to know, your, your family members are going to know, everybody's going to know. Paul writes, when, when, when this happened, when, when he was feeling called to, to take it out to the Gentiles, when this happened, I did not rush out and consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem and consult with those who were apostles before I was, before I was because wh- why? They would have all said, no, dude, you got it wrong. He says, instead, I went away to Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Prayer, Bible study, obedience, we try to help you do all those things, but it's so important that you're doing what you've got to do on your own also. Number four, believer-to-believer relationships are are important for spiritual growth. The church, God created the church to do his work. We're going to grow as we do things together. Um, eight, verse 18, then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle that I met with at this time was James, the Lord's brother. 24-7, you get the world's culture thrown at you. By the way, this is something you need to think about with your kids. If the only discipling your kids are getting is the hour they have back here with our Kid Connection, they're getting loved on, they're being taught the Bible, but if they're not getting it taught by you, the whole rest of the time they're awake, somebody else is teaching them something else. We need the ironing, iron sharpens iron. We talked last week about the fact that bad friends are bad company and and that that they will change you in a negative way. You've got to put yourself, you've got to keep yourself in a certain amount of Christian culture. You've got to get out there in the world for the world, but not in the world. But you can, you know, don't raise your hand. How many of you listen to Christian music? Some people think, oh, Christian music's cheesy. It's not nearly as good as as Led Zeppelin or whatever, but it's the words. I told you, during that last song, I was jumping almost back there. You know, like I said, if it wasn't, we're going to have concrete floor in the new building, by the way. But, but I was just, but it was just the words. I'm listening to the words and, 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 and the, and the song that Tambor sang, I don't know about you, but man, I, I was doing this in just tears. I'm thinking, I got to get it together because I'm about to get up there and talk. You know, it's, you, you, you've got you've to be a part of, it. You, you, you've got to allow the culture of being a Christian to affect the way you are. Number five, be confident and stay consistently in the truth. Be confident and stay consistently in the truth. Now, I, I want you to write something right beside that, okay? Because I'm just telling you this up front. Right beside, be confident and stay consistently in the truth. I want you to write this. I will be persecuted. And then you can write yay right beside that. Because God said he's going to bless you for that. He's going to bless you. He's not going to bless you for being a jerk. He's going to bless you for being loving and being obedient. Paul says in verse 20, I declare before God that I am writing this to you. It's not a lie. Number six, you will be surprised and humbled by the way God uses you and your influence on others. You will be surprised and humbled by the way God uses you and your influence on others. Let's go back to TPNL, and I'd just given my life to the Lord, and I wasn't going to the bachelor parties, and I and I wasn't cussing, and man, they were. I'm I'm not kidding you guys. Nobody was beating me up. Nobody was waiting on me in the parking lot. But they're walking by my desk, and they're dropping the F-bomb, and they're doing this, and they go, oh, and they look over my cubicle. You know, I don't, y'all don't work in those cubicles. You know, it's like the tall guys can stand right here. The, us guys, we got to go like this. But they'd look over the cubicle and go, oh, sorry, I said that in front of the Christian. And, you know, they just gave me a hard time all the time, and, and I'll just tell you it wasn't very fun. But when I stayed consistent, when I didn't lose it, when I didn't call him an idiot, when I didn't do all that stuff that you see people doing on Facebook now and stuff all the time, you see people doing on street corners with their signs, when when I just did my thing and was kind and did my work, by the way, it's important that you do your job. I see Christians all the time, they're the ones that take the most breaks, they're the ones that slough off the most. Dude, you need to be working harder than anybody because you're working for God. That's one of the things that impresses people. 
But all of a sudden, one day, one of the ones that gave me the hardest time came to my cubicle and said, Hey, can we go talk? This marriage was falling apart. Then it was real easy to say, I think you need to stop going to the strip joints and hooters. You need to focus on your wife. But he had, I had built up enough respect for him. But, but the respect, he didn't let other people see them talking to me. He wanted to go talk to me in the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? That is cool. And it's humbling. And it's awesome. And, and that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. Because what people want most of the time is they want you cheering them on even when they're doing things they know they're not supposed to do. But what happens is when, when, they, when, they, when they see that you really are the real deal, not the screaming, yelling, mean deal, the real deal, it influences them. And they want to know what you got because they know they don't have it. Look at this uh, Start with verse, is that verse 21? After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the Christians in the churches in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was what people were saying. The one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Look, go back to that. They're going to persecute me. I promise you. I just will promise you. Especially if you're in an office that people pretty freely talk immorally and do immoral things and watch immoral things and all that. If you walk into the office Monday and you're changed, you're not, you're not you're not looking down your noses at them. You're not whatever. You just, you just stop doing that stuff. And, and, and you just say, you know, I just don't need to be doing that anymore. I, I, I just, I've just kind of recommitted my life to God. And, and I just want to live for God. That's what I want to do. And, 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 I, and I'm still going to support you. I'm going to do the best job that I can possibly can. And, and if you go at it humbly, not pridefully. Remember, pride makes you an enemy of God. So when you're prideful around people, you don't actually have God on your side at that point. That's like going in without your armor, you know, just prepared to get smacked. But try it. Go to school Monday and go, huh? today I start living for the Lord. That doesn't just mean I go to church and youth group. It means I live for the Lord. And it will, it will change everything. It will change everything. And what happens is, is it will change other people. You will be humbled. They praised God because of me. They praised God because of the change that happened in me, the Apostle Paul says. And then look at Matthew 5. This is the last verse. Jesus said, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your what good deeds shine out. Circle good deeds with you, because some people just think that means uh, let your light shine just means go to church. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. That's your goal. Okay, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to represent God. What's my goal? To get everyone to the point where they're worshiping the Father too. That's the goal. It's not me. The goal is getting people worshiping the Father.